Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this kind of controversial topic. So this is what I want to cover today in some of it. I've stolen this graphic from the preserved um, study that I will refer to later. And I think it's important, if you remember nothing, this shows you that the only thing IVC filters are designed to do is to stop a clot going from there to the lungs. It does nothing about your prothrombotic drive. So cancer-associated thrombosis, as we've heard, is associated with a two to six-fold increase in risk of mortality in patients. It can affect ongoing cancer treatment, leading to delays or alterations of treatment. There is both a high risk of recurrence and bleeding, so the issue of filters is frequently raised with us. The evidence for filters in general is quite poor. So they're simply a metal alloy device to trap emboli from the DVTs. The Cochrane Collaboration did a review in 2010 and came up with no conclusions because they thought the evidence basis was too poor. The first major study was the PREPIC study, and that looked at 400 patients, 14% of which had cancer, and they had a proximal DVT and were randomized to three months anticoagulation, plus or minus a filter. So at eight years, which is significant follow-up, they had reduced the, a filter had reduced the risk of PE, but had increased the risk of DVT and had no effect on mortality. The PREPIC2 was a follow-up study. It looked at hospitalized patients with PE, and they had to have one high-risk feature. So in 15.5% of the patients, the high-risk feature was active cancer. They were randomized to anticoagulation with or without a filter for six months. At three months, PE had occurred in six patients in the filter group, and all were, filter, or all were fatal. There was also PEs in the no-filter group, but I think this is significant because all you're trying to do is to prevent PEs, so it's failed here. There was no other differences within the group. Looking at um, the evidence for IVC filters in cancer patients, it's even worse. So this is a large retrospective cohort page, or study of cancer patients from California with acute DVT. It's um, registry data, so 19.6% of them had um, IVC filters inserted, and this varied greatly between institutions and cancer types. The strongest predictors of IVC filter use were brain cancer, major surgery, and bleeding. But it's important to note that only one in five of them had a contraindication to anticoagulation. So you're considering why are the filters going in? There was no benefit in 30-day mortality, and 56% had an increase in recurrent VTE. And Surprisingly, the IVC filters had a higher risk of bleeding. This is some of the other data. It's a very busy slide, but as you can see, it's all retrospective, and all quite poor. The advanced stage cancers are more likely to have filters inserted, but they're also more likely to have venous thrombosis. A mixture of the cancer types, very little data on retrieval, and again, a mix of indications depending on the study. But if you look at the last line, which is probably the most important, complications, four PEs, 15.9% of, of VTE at 30 days, three PEs, 15 PEs. So the PEs aren't going anywhere. Um, looking at the cohort studies in more detail, so these are patients with acute VTE and filters, and they looked at cancer versus non-cancer patients. In these, the, risk, the complication rates were similar. The only difference was a much lower rate of retrieval in the cancer patients. In this study, cancer patients had significantly higher rates of VTE with a relative risk of 1.9. So this is some of the only prospective randomized data that there is. And this looks at patients with cancer and acute VTE, and they were randomized to fondoparinux or fondoparinux and an IVC filter. There was only 64 patients involved in the study. And at baseline, they could either have a DVT or a PE, but they were screened for whatever they didn't have to ensure that any events that were just diagnosed during the study were new events. And they're looking, again, at rates of thrombosis and filter complications. So as you can see, the two groups were pretty well matched. No patients had DVT, but two patients had new PEs, one in each of the groups. So that's one in about 30. Major bleeding occurred in both groups. Um, and two patients out of the group had IVC filter complications on, at insertion. So one had a significant enough DVT that they needed a thrombectomy, and one had bleeding issues that necessitated prolonged hospitalization. 
So as we've said, burden of disease is huge. So if we're doing things that are prolonging their hospitalization, that's a significant burden for the patient. Interestingly, they showed that there was complete resolution of VTE in 51% of the patients within eight weeks. So anticoagulation clearly works in this cohort. Um, looking at the guidelines in general, um, for IVC filters in all populations, ACCP, NICE, and Society of Interventional Radiology all have very vague guidelines. The word consider is used many times, but mainly it's um, bleeding, contraindications to anticoagulation, and then some people say prophylaxis in high-risk patients. And these are more cancer-specific. So in, with ESMO, they say consider um, if there's contraindication to anticoagulation, and BSH also do the same. But there's more focus here of getting the filter out. ISDH kind of say that there's no data for IVC filters in cancer, and that cancer really doesn't come into it. Consider the insertion of an IVC filter based on other indications. So then looking at complications. So rather than medications that we've discussed more today, this is a device. So the FDA have a database of, compl of complications that are reported to them. And they issued a report in 2010. So this is 10 years of data. They looked at 842 complications. And the most likely ones were filter migration, filter fracture, and IVC perforation. This is obviously not insignificant. Um, they found that these were more likely to occur if the filter had been in for more than 30 days. However, this is a voluntary reporting, so they feel that this is grossly underestimating the complication rate. In another review, they divided complications up between insertion-related and, prolonged insert, or, and prolonged, more prolonged complications. And here you've got a, lots. You've got puncture, misplacement, migration, failure to deploy, perforation, and a symptomatic access site DVT. And then the later complications, migration, fracture, thrombosis, DVTs. And again, this, this constant problem of recurrent PE is coming up again and again in all the studies. So this is something that my patients with cancer always ask me about. So they're so concerned about infection, and that's because we've taught them this, and we're putting a foreign body into their bodies and they know they're going to drop their counts and they're wondering what's gonna happen infection-wise. So there's very little data in the literature. There's some small retrospective case series and reports. This is a case series of, out of 406 insertions, they report three infections. One is a year after the initial insertion, and two are immediately post-insertion. Only one is in a cancer patient. The patient has um, APL. This is in a patient who was an IV, or IV drug user who were currently injected, so not surprising that they had an infection. And this other patient um, had a candida infection following candida thrombophlebitis, which migrated and seeded to the filter. So all these patients settled when their filters were removed. So the preserved study that I stole the graphic from previously um, is a product of the FDA report from 2010. So they were very concerned that filters were being put in and in the States, you can bill for a filter put going in, but coming out is less important from the insurance companies, so it's not done as regularly and the data isn't as good. So what these, so the Society of Interventional Radiologists and the Society of Vascular Surgeons said we need to do a proper study looking at what happens. So a lot of the studies previously, um, such as PREPIC, have been looking just at what happens from a PE point of view with filters. But what this study aims to do is to look at what happens to people when you put filters into them. Do they get PEs and DVTs? Do the filters move? Do the filters come out? Do the filters fracture? So they're looking at recruiting 1,800 patients over five years in 60 centers in the States. Um, and they will be followed up for up to 24 months or one month after filter removal. And they will have telephone follow-ups, clinical examination, and they will be imaged routinely. So they're actively looking for complications here. And again, that's a little bit wordy, but I'm trying to keep to time so we can finish at an appropriate time as it's Friday. So this is expected to finish recruiting in 2019. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more perspective data then about what actually happens with filters 
from all the complications. So this is just a case I wanted to discuss. It's a lady who was a new patient in clinic two weeks ago who I found kind of summed up a lot of the issues we have had. So she's a 56-year-old lady who was well until January 2017 when she presented to her local hospital with a DVT and a PE. As per their protocol, they commenced her on rivaroxaban and she was treated in an ambulatory way. She returned to the hospital about a week later with a significant vaginal bleeding, so much so that she required red cell transfusion. At that point, she was switched to um, on fractionate, or low molecular weight heparin, and she was seen by the gyne gynecologist who were concerned about an endometrial malignancy. She was scheduled for surgery and was discharged while that was happening because the bleeding had settled on the low molecular weight heparin. She came in a couple of days later with bilateral blindness. So she's just been told she had a clot, cancer, now she's blind, and is diagnosed with an occipital stroke. At this stage, she was changed to twice a day low molecular weight heparin. Luckily, she regained her vision quite quickly. The bleeding again became problematic, so she had a filter inserted. So she's proven that she's incredibly prothrombotic, arterial and venous events, clotted on standard anticoagulation. So clearly she's an issue. But I'm, I'm still not clear that putting something that is a nidus for thrombosis is your best option here. So she went on to have her surgery. It was managed with unfractionated heparin in the perioperative period. She had no immediate complications and she was transitioned back to low molecular weight heparin three days later. All very well. She had a scan, or she had scheduled for filter removal very appropriately within 30 days because that's when all the side effects are meant to happen. Unfortunately, they couldn't remove her filter due to the massive tumour burden on it. Before she started her adjuvant chemo, they said, let's do a scan just to see how much of the cancer we've gotten out. And the surgeons had done really well. They'd taken everything out. But she's got a new PE in a totally different location to her previous imaging. So again, if you think about how this patient is feeling, it's just event upon event upon event. So I, I saw her in clinic to discuss all these issues and where we would proceed. So she's very aware herself that she's very prothrombotic. She's about to start adjuvant chemotherapy with a platinum compound, of course, because it's a gynecological malignancy. So that's only going to make things worse. She has an IVC filter in situ with a large clot burden that is embolizing off and leading to PE. And she's very anxious about how this will affect her. So she's anxious about will it change when she starts her chemotherapy? Will it change the type of chemotherapy she gets? Will she get, get an infection? Because that's all her oncologist has been talking about when she starts chemo in her education. And will she get another clot? Because we've already shown on multiple occasions that we can't prevent this lady getting a clot. We failed on multiple occasions. She was also told when she had her filter in that it had to come out, and it had to come out as soon as possible. So now she's wondering, can she get the filter out ever? Can, will it stop her chemo? Can she get it done before chemo? Will she get an infection? So not only is she dealing with all her other issues, but the filter is significantly contributing to her worries and her burdens. So just to sum up, the evidence base is very poor and it's mainly based on case reports. And I think in most cases, it's based on people trying to do the best for their patient, thinking that they have no other option and they want to do something. So they look like they're progressing through anticoagulation. And the last speaker very elegantly showed how many strategies there are to work with low molecular weight heparin either going to BD dosing, increasing the dosing, but at least you're not increasing their thrombotic risk by doing this, because a filter does nothing to your prothrombotic risk with cancer and can make it worse. I think I've shown that through all the studies, PEs are appearing again and again. And this is all we're trying to do by putting filters in, is to stop PEs. We're not trying to do anything else. I think it's very important to have a multidisciplinary, individualized approach so this lady really needed a lot of time to talk about all the issues because she'd just been, had so many diagnoses and that's what she wanted to discuss and she wanted some answers. And unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of evidence to back up any of my answers. I told her what I thought was safe to do, what was reasonable to do. And I, thought, I told her that she needed her chemotherapy for her very active malignancy and we would try and work around that. Now she has no symptoms from her, P, her recent PE 
she's feeling very well, she's coping well with her injections. So we're going to see her relatively frequently and see how we get on. But we will try and get the filter out, maybe between cycles or depending on how we go. So I think it's also important to know that situations can change quickly. So they need to be frequently re-evaluated. So you can make a plan, but the plan may not work. And then you can think of another plan. You don't need to just put a filter in because your anticoagulation strategy hasn't worked. You may need to just adjust a little bit. With our lady, her filter was put in six weeks after her PE diagnosis, which would be out of the really big high-risk time. And she'd actually had Dopplers done before her surgery and had no DVT evidence. So again, the filter is probably treating the physician more than the patient because they feel I've done something but I'm not sure we've helped our patient. Thanks very much.